This lesson has been put together with the intention of preparing you yet again for your exams. More towards section one, but at the same time to give you a bit more depth in understanding of what postmodernism really is. At the moment you have some understanding, you should be able to list for me the characteristics of postmodernism, but I want to take you one step or two steps further in your understanding of what postmodernism essentially is. So what we have on the board is our lesson intentions and our success criteria for today. So by the end of this lesson, I hope you understand what the characteristics of postmodernism are, that you'll be able to, your success, whether or not you actually understood what I wanted you to do today, will be that you can list these things without having to look at your notes. And more importantly, you'll be able to apply the knowledge that you've learned from this lesson to a new situation. Um, time is going to be um, probably against us to get through everything, but I want to try and quickly get through information about postmodernism. A lot of this you already know, so it's going to be a case of revisiting. And then I've got two exam questions here, one from the 2014 half yearly exam and the 2014 trial exam. Both of them are questions that deal with postmodernism. So I want to see how well you can just quickly address those questions through brainstorming more than anything else. Okay? So that's where we're heading. We're going to watch some videos. At the end of each section, or each artist in the, in the first video, I'm going to stop and explain things. If at any point there is something that you need clarified or you're completely unsure about what on earth you're being subjected to, please put a hand up, interrupt me, and I will do my best to try and explain anything to you. Are you ready? Okay. ...which hopefully brings a little clarity to some of those art-isms. And this week, it's a real monster. So good luck to writer Daniel Burt as he tends to grapple with postmodernism. Our next ism is big. It's contemporary, it's contentious, and sometimes it's downright confusing. It's supposed to be after everything that we thought was new. But what is postmodernism? It's a big question, and while I'm not sure there is a definitive answer, the NGV seems a good place to start. Daniel, the thing about postmodernism, it's such a tricky term because all of the theoreticians and philosophers are still debating exactly what it means. And the possibility that all of their opinions could in some way be right is in itself very postmodern. So when it comes to art, parody and appropriation will be two of the key postmodern tools. You'll see artists borrow ideas and imagery from pop culture, from past art movements and even from each other. And I reckon we'll find some great examples of that in here. So the first artist I want to introduce you to is the king of post-pop, Jeff Koons. Look at this. This is enormous. This is enormous. These two paintings are from the Easy Fun Ethereal series. They're painted in about 2000. This is mountains and this is sandwiches. They look like um, big adverts. I, you know, I, should, I feel like I should be buying something. You should exactly feel like you should be buying something. Coons wants to communicate with the masses and so he uses the language of advertising to communicate. What do you suppose makes this postmodern? Appropriation is a key approach for postmodern and the way Coons borrows his imagery from junk mail and all manner of popular culture and also the way he's borrowed from so many different historical styles such as Rococo, Baroque, their, their photorealist paintings, they're very surreal. It's very intricate and this it must have taken him forever. Well, it's unlikely that Coons himself painted these. This what? is a really interesting aspect of these works, is that it, the, the modernist notion of artist as hero, you know, the original, has completely gone out the window. Daniel, you might also know some of Coons' works, for example, the work which was the three basketballs. I've seen it, yeah. It's suspended yeah. in the tanks. It's actually full of water and there's just three basketballs. That work is particularly postmodern in the sense that it refers to the way uh, the independent movement of any of those balls, even within that space, react upon each other and everything around them. It's a very multi-layered work, if you like. The wit with which Coons borrows from the everyday, such as if you see his work with the vacuum cleaners, oh, yeah, yeah. he's yeah. made the wall like kettles. It's this wit with which he ridicules his own work that makes his approach so postmodern. Can you still be postmodern? 
I mean, that's 2000. Absolutely, you can still be postmodern, but postmodernity is the attitude and the politics that you bring to your work, and not just the era in which you make it. And Coons has got attitude in spades. There's parody, there's appropriation, the loss of artist is hero. Coons' work is not what it appears to be. Right. Just to stop there for a moment, what did you pick up from that quick blurb about Jeff Koons, his kind of interpretation of postmodern? What did you hear the, the two interviewers or the two people speaking, what did they say about Koons that was particularly postmodern? He borrows imagery. He borrows imagery, yes. Where does he borrow the imagery from? Popular culture. Popular culture? Where else? Historical styles in particular, did you pick up the two styles that he borrows from? Baroque and Rococo were the two styles that he borrows from. Excellent. What else did you pick up? What else was he doing that was particularly postmodern? Yep, he appropriated, but he used the language of advertising to communicate. Okay, so we were appropriating pop culture, but in particular, how did he do that? He was copying or appropriating advertising techniques. You felt like you wanted to buy these things. And probably the next aspect was, and he went, really? Um, is it that he would make them like many layers of meaning? His work had many layers of meaning, which is very typical of postmodernism, but he was doing something else. <laughs> that, uh, that's right, he doesn't actually make his own artwork. Now that's quite a big shift. You know all about Manet, and Manet's talking about challenging the traditions of art. And he challenges that through new um, applications of paint and all that we've already challenged and talked about with Manet. Now, Manet was probably one of the most uh, earliest artists with Courbet, who were part of the modernist period. And modernism really, I suppose, uh, elevated the artist into a place of being a hero, a genius, a great man, more often than a great woman, because there weren't many females who, who made art and with that that we know of. And there was this real, still quite a heavy influence, except with Duchamp, on the idea of the skilled artist. Duchamp, we know, actually challenges that. But we've got Jeff Koons, who actually goes that one step further, inspired by the arguments of Marcel Duchamp, who was a, a modernist artist. And remember that modernism is not something that's modern, but modernism essentially in its most, I suppose, pure form is artworks about that particular time in history. Their artworks were about their contemporary day. Not ours, but theirs. Postmodernism is, and you're going to learn very quickly, a very difficult definition to actually nail. But that's how Jeff Koons deals with it, those three main things. Okay? Now let's have a look at what Cindy Sherman does. Yes? Um, what were the two styles you would have? Rococo and Baroque. So B-A-R-O-Q-U-E is Baroque and Rococo is R-O-C-O-C-O. Remembering that this is all being taped so you can go home and catch up on this. Now, the next person we're going to watch is Cindy Sherman. And you're going to hopefully notice that what she does is another interpretation on postmodernism. Here we go. This is Cindy Sherman's untitled number 112, which was made in 1982. By this stage, Cindy moved into colour. An earlier series that she's particularly well known for is the untitled Film Still series, which was principally black and white. Although at Cindy Sherman we've seen all these photographs, she's very much role-playing. These are not self-portraits. So the characters that she plays in the untitled Film Still series all look like they've been modelled on uh, stereotypical roles for women that have come out of B-grade movies or television or the media. And the scary thing is how today we still recognise those they are still prevalent in the media today. Why is Cindy Sherman postmodern? Sherman manages to use parody to reveal these roles as constructed, and accordingly, this is what makes her uh, such a chief exponent of postmodernism. When do we just stop and say, all right, Cindy, 
we get it. Everything's everything's made up in a construct. Well, I think that Sherman, she's always reinventing herself and her ideas and how she explores these layered uh, ways of investigating uh, yeah. how the world is put together. So I think she's going to remain a, a very key contemporary artist for a long time. She's not over yet. No, she's the certainly The green range is on. That's right. Don't see me. Okay, so what's the difference with this particular artist? What's the focus, her postmodern focus? She uses parody. She uses parody, but for what reason? Okay, they used a particular word. Construct. So you've heard me bandy that word around a bit when I've been talking about Manet. And when we get to postmodernism, what postmodern artists are essentially doing is they are challenging what the constructs of the society actually claims to be true and correct. So, with Cindy Sherman, she's actually challenging the constructs of the stereotypes of the roles of women. And she uses, again, popular culture, whether it be B-grade movies, TV shows, or whatever, that have dictated to us about how women should behave, how they should dress, what their role is in society. And you will start to pick up quite quickly that when you start to look at postmodern artworks, that in every single one there is many constructs that are being challenged. And essentially, if you break it down, here's another aspect of postmodernism. Postmodern artists, postmodern writers, postmodern musicians, are actually challenging what we consider to be true. What is the truth? There is no, no such thing as truth. That is what they're actually challenging. And when you think about people like Maury Mura, what's he challenging? He's using references to Manet's Olympia in his artwork for Targo. But there are a whole range of social and cultural constructs that he's actually challenging and making comments about. Is this making sense to everyone? Excellent. All right, here comes our next artist. His name is Matthew Blaney. This is Matthew Blaney's Cream Master Cycle, and this is the last piece I wanted to show you because it was really going to be like nothing you've ever seen before. Yes, well, it's visually spectacular. It's a series of five films that he made out of sequence between 1994 and 2002. Is it the fact that it's on film? Is that why it's postmodern? Well, no, film is the media. Postmodern is more the attitude okay. or the framework that it's made in. What's he trying to say? Well, that's very hard to tell because it, uh, the, the linear narrative has completely gone out the window here. This is very multi-layered. Even the camera angles change all the time. One minute it's straight on, the next minute it's bird's eye view. All of these different layers and paths through the film are one indicator that this work comes from a postmodern approach. Is there an element of, oh, look, I'll make horses do funny things and uh, we'll see how they interpret it? Barney's a pretty complex person. I think he knows exactly what he's doing in every second and every nuance of these films. What these labyrinths and plots in these five different films show us is that Barney sees the world on multiple levels from loads of different angles and he's really inviting us to do the same. The reason that the Cream Master Cycle could be seen as postmodern is that the imagery involved is very open to multi-layered fluid readers. Because it's crazy, because it's, there's no narrative, because it's totally wild, that pretty much almost makes it Because you can approach it from any angle you like. Okay, Matthew Barney, why is he postmodern? Okay, good. His artwork, rather than giving you a single narrative, which is what traditionally we are used to, and we know that Mene challenges that by back in 1863, so this idea of getting rid of a narrative is nothing new. But here we have not one narrative, not two narratives, not three narratives, not four narratives, but an infinite number of possible interpretations of this artwork. So as an audience member, when you go in and you actually view Barney's work, is your interpre interpretation wrong or right? It's right. Because you're going in with your own subjective responses, 
you're going in and you're looking at the work, you're experiencing the work, and you'll come out with your own idea about what it's about. The lovely thing about postmodernism is that you use your general knowledge to actually start to interact and make sense of the world. The other aspect about um, this particular work here, Premaster Cycle by, um, by Bainey, is that he's actually looking at how we actually experience our world, which you guys can very much identify with. You've got a device in your pocket, a device in front of you, you've got TV going on in the background, a whole, you're having a conversation with somebody, you've got all these different things constantly happening and giving you information. Now, if we string them all together, and show snippets of what you're doing without your stream of consciousness to actually make sense of them, then you end up with a video like Matthew Barney gave us. There's all these different things that we're exposed to. Do you get what I just said there? When he's looked at that artwork, when he's put those things together, his, his intention, we don't know what his intention was, then his intention could be completely different to how his audience responds to it and understands it. And that is part of what he's actually making a comment about in terms of his society, his time, the time that we're currently living. Although we're not living in postmodernism anymore, we're actually in the next cycle, which is ultramodernism. But in terms of what he's talking about, there is no way that you can actually reflect life in a really simplistic way now. There is no truth, there is no single narrative. All these things that we have come to expect as the way art operates are all constructs. Does that make sense, everyone? All right. Yes, he made a painting from like the Renaissance period. So go in the Renaissance, like he made it today. Can you go in the Renaissance period or the new period? What do you think the answer to that question would be? You don't know? Anyone else have got an answer? Okay, we've got an appropriation happening. Depends on the meaning, maybe. Why would you, I suppose the question comes back to your intention. If you painted that image, what is your intention for the artwork? Yeah. So if you're painting an image of, I don't know, a dying saint in the style of Caravaggio then you've just basically copied something, haven't you? Okay. You haven't done anything to add any recontextualization to it. However, if your intention is, I'm painting in a, a style similar to the Baroque style of, uh, of Caravaggio, but I'm using uh, a contemporary male model who looks very, um, uh, very gay maybe, then the dialogue and the constructs then start to change. And it starts to be a conversation possibly about image, identity, where does religion fit into the way that homosexuality is viewed by the church, and then it becomes a whole different kettle of fish. So it depends on what your intention is, because if you're an artist that's just copying the style of the Renaissance because you like that style, then it's nothing. It's just, you know, a nice picture. Yeah. But if there are other subtle things happening, then it starts to become all, all these things that we've just heard. Does that answer yeah. your question? Okay. I'm going to show you another video now. You don't need to listen to any more of that. The next one we're going to listen to is a young guy talking about postmodernism. And it's important that you watch the first one to begin with. So as you listen to what he says, hopefully things will start to become that little bit more clearer. Postmodernism? That's easy. It's, um, it's... Um, if there is one thing that is confusing as hell, it is postmodernism. Because it's actually not even a philosophy, it's just a way of analyzing things. At its heart, postmodernism is a critique of modernism, go figure, and of structures, sometimes it's 
Postmodernism is referred to as post-structuralism. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, because what it means is that postmodernism is a critique of what we assume to be real. Postmodernism argues that there's no absolute truth and that the basic structures on which we've built our whole society are just social constructs. So some of these social constructs could include power relations, gender binaries, um, social classes, all the kinds of things that we take for granted and we assume are real or fixed. Postmodernism actually plays with, satirizes, or just completely deconstructs and says, well, no, these actually aren't necessarily true or inherently true. They are things that we've created as a society or as cultures, and now we just believe to be the truth. So, one of the constructs that postmodernism wants to break down is the whole idea of good versus evil. It also wants to break down this idea of the binary male and female. Which brings us to why postmodernism is such a difficult concept to work with as a student, because there's really no set or agreed upon definition of it. It's again a simply a way of analyzing or critiquing different frameworks, but isn't one idea in and of itself. So it's important to remember that there's lots of people who came from a very diverse background um, and from many different situations in life that considered themselves postmodernists or were considered by other people to be postmodernists, but didn't subscribe to uh, a set of values that everybody agreed upon and decided, okay, this is what postmodernism means. So much so, in fact, that nobody even can agree upon whether or not we're still in the postmodern era. So postmodernism is generally believed to have been started somewhere in the late 19th century as kind of a reaction to the hyper-rationalism of people at the time. People who were arguing that they were different scientific theories or religious theories that could explain everything. Postmodernism, on the other hand, argued that nothing was purely objective, and that all of these things, all of these assumptions and different structures that people were coming up with were predicated upon, well, society, the cultures that they came out of, that there was no true objective truth because people basically would come in and screw it up and put in their own source of ideas and uh, make everything really confusing. Still confused? Don't worry. Most people are. Like I said before, there is no agreed upon definition of postmodernism, but basically you can think of it as any view that, you know, post the modern period, that is challenging the norm, that is challenging ideas of structure, of binaries, of rational thought. That's what postmodernism is supposedly in opposition to. Essentially, to summarize, postmodernism is really more about challenging certain structures rather than being something in and of itself. So, no wonder it's so bloody complicated, because nobody can agree on what it actually means. The best way to understand it is to go out and look at postmodern architecture, literature, um, oh, what else? Probably music. Yeah, that'll work. Bird just flew by the window. That might be postmodernism. Okay. So, I, I thought that was quite fun because he does manage to actually make it quite clear that this could be quite difficult when people think about modernism. Modernism has all these other isms that are all nice and, and well explained and all happen to fit in nice little pigeonholes, or so art history tells us. So if you look at, for example, futurism, which we studied in, way back in year nine, there was uh, a manifesto that um, Marinetti actually wrote about what they believed in and all the futurists actually adhered to and agreed with those rules and constructs of how they were going to make their artworks. So all the way through the late 19th century into the early 20th century, we can look at all the constructs that are there. Then we get into, well, I was around about the 1960s, early 70s, when people are going, mm, hang on, this, this, you know, this is not right. Feminism is actually really starting to become quite a, a force to be reckoned with. Um, gay rights are starting to galvanise uh, more, um, more of a, a, a following. 
I think in the 70s they got rid of the laws, at least in, in some Western nations, that it was no longer a crime to be gay. And as a result of this, things started to change in terms of how society viewed um, a lot of the constructs that we had accepted as truth. Art always is the canary in the coal mine, just in case you don't understand what that uh, phrase means. In the olden days, miners used to take canaries in a cage down into the coal mine with them. If they ran out of, if they were running out of oxygen, the canary would die first and they knew to get out. So when I say artists are the canaries in the coal mine, artists have a really important job, although the world hasn't yet caught up to how important what we do is. And this is why whether you become artists or not when you leave this school and go off to university, the education, the thinking, the critical way that you learn to think in this subject, maybe drama does it as well, in some ways, other subjects would too, but in this subject, we really, we really drive you to actually think about the world you live in and how things have been taught to you as absolute truths. You will walk out of here going, oh, everything's not actually truth, and you start to go, okay, where does that actually make me fit? You will have your own truths that you stick to. Postmodernism's job was to actually encourage the audience to broaden their horizons, okay? To think about things that in the past they would not even consider thinking about. It's that idea that Duchamp starts off with way back in the early 20th century to engage an audience to have an intellectual conversation with an artwork. Okay? Now, there's one more video that I want you to watch. This one's a only goes for four minutes. However, uh, again, it's just going to deal with this whole thing about what is postmodernism. And you're going to get a whole range of different people trying to explain it and unable to explain it, but reinforcing what you've heard already in the past two videos and those things that I've highlighted for you. You ready? Exploration Films. Check us out on the web at explorationfilms.com. People say that days have been old and it was 30 years ago, and for the most part, they're right. You think about things differently. And of course, to be able to explore that, you have to be able to answer the question what is postmodernism? Postmodernism? Hmm. Postmodernism? What do you think about that? I don't know. <laughs> Not really. Great question. Is it post-usually what comes after? That is a tough question. Well, according to Billy Corgan, um, postmodernism is whatever the fuck you want it to be. Sorry. The first difficulty in defining postmodernism is that everybody gets a crack at it. But postmodernism is what we have after modernism is over. Modernism is really the world you associate with the rise of modern science. People believed in prior. Okay. They're making something quite important. Uh, making a comment about something quite important here, which I haven't said to you yet, and that is what modernism was trying to do. And that was this idea that science could actually deliver truth, or religion could deliver truth. And if you could actually explain everything through science, then everything would then make sense. Okay? So, mo uh, the modernist period, and you can look at any of the isms in the early... 20th century and the late uh, 19th century, they're all pursuing elements of those sorts of things, whether it's um, the symbolists who are actually pushing against traditional religion and looking at other forms of belief, or if you're looking at um, the importance of science when you've got uh, people like um, Freud, and Carl Jung and their discoveries about the way that the brain operates, mental health issues uh, start to be acknowledged as not demon possession, but instead maybe someone's actually really honestly sick here and what might we do to actually um, facilitate healing? It's an illness, let's use science to help us. So science becomes a very important element to how modernism as a big understanding is understood and responded to by not just visual artists, 
but all created people. Okay? Does that help a little bit? Grace. The role of human reason, or the idea that reason will eventually be able to give us every answer to all ills. In fact, it exalted reason to such a degree that it tended to put faith second. Now, that's last century. In the 21st century, all of those kinds of modern thought have become old-fashioned. If you think of modernism as symbolized by Tower of Babel trying to reach up and replace God, postmodernism is the Babel that came after that, when people lost the ability to communicate um, because there's no common language or presuppositions. Having said that, I don't really think it's possible to define postmodernism. Let me define postmodernism. Let me give it a go. And of course, there are many different ways of defining it. It's an attitude towards truth claims, the kind of suspicion of all absolute truth claims. Truth claims are not what, they're, what they seem to be. In fact, truth claims are attempts to control other people. That's one way of defining postmodernity. A recent French philosopher, Jean-Francois Lanto, defined postmodernism as incredulity towards all meta-narratives and incredulity toward meta-narratives. That's a mouthful, but basically what it means is a kind of skeptical attitude towards all claims of absolute truth, meta-narratives. Now the actual word he uses in French really translates into English as big stories. There are all kinds of big stories. One kind of big story might be Human beings, by way of human reason, are capable of knowing everything. Another big story is that by way of modern medicine, we are able to cure all ills. Those are just some big stories. Postmodern would say there are many, many different stories. Other people might talk about it in terms of the uh, rejection of, of any one narrative, any one story. The fact that it is postmodern after a particular period suggests that it's, it's still open to interpretation. It's still yet, yet to be defined in many respects. You don't know if it's an actual period or transition to another period. Postmodernism or postmodernity is all over the map. So you have all sorts of people who can be quite disparate things calling themselves postmoderns. So you get fragmentation. Uh, people pull in different directions. Even the same person pulled in different directions. Maybe there is no way we can find any kind of objective truth. There isn't really anyone who is sort of able, certainly I'm not, to stand up and say, I am the arbiter of what postmodernism is. Postmodernism is a kind of bastard offshoot of modernism. It, it's an illegitimate child and is constantly trying to kill its, its parents. But in one sense, it's, it still partakes of the same problem, uh, namely the elevation of the individual and of the subgroup to the point where it is impossible for anybody to listen to God. Exploration films, where cure. Okay. So, how do, you, how do you feel now about postmodernism? It's a much bigger animal than what you thought before. I feel better than I Ah, good. Affirmation. Nobody else knows what it is either. That's good. Okay. Uh, we can ignore this for a moment. I'm going to show you quickly, because we're running out of time, so we're not going to get a chance to, um, to look at the next lesson. But, okay, you've had all this information explained to you today. You've written down things um, at a rate of knots while those videos have been going and also as I've been speaking. This is uh, the beginning of a PowerPoint that we won't get through, of course, because time is against us. But if we look at this image over here on the right-hand side, this nude figure, what is it... Where's the, what, is, what kind of information could you bring to interpret that artwork? They're challenging Michelangelo. Okay, how are they challenging Michelangelo? Well, pretty Okay, the language of postmodernism. Okay, words like construct or, or deconstruct and constructs of society, appropriation, recontextualization, parody, irony, uh, satire, use of materials that are non traditional, and they're some of the headline things that we do. So how is he actually challenging Michelangelo today? Um, what has he done that's the most obvious thing? I'm not familiar with the language, so I don't know. Or just give me your, your version then. Well, first Michelangelo is all about you know, the perfect body and everything, and that's that. 
and now he's fat. Okay, so you've made an observation and you've described what you can see. What's the interpretation in terms of what the artist might be trying to say about the constructs of postmodern life or life as we know it now? Hardly anyone has a perfect body. Hardly anyone has a perfect body? What else? Remember that all these answers are all correct. Um, he's deconstructing the concept of how the other human figure is perfect in that time, and that essentially all human figures are perfect. Okay, so what we've got from Catalina is this idea that the original artwork from which this one's been appropriated, postmodern language, um, the original artwork by Michelangelo was about the perfection of the human body. And we know that he was inspired by the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, especially the Greeks. And we know that a lot of his actual art-making technical skill was inspired by the ancient Greeks. But essentially, iconically speaking, it's about the beauty of the male form. Jump ahead into in this time, most people are overweight. Most people are overweight. Talking about the abundance of society, consumerism, um, issues with people's health, and the bigger social story that comes as a result of obesity. Health issues, you know, all self-image issues. Um, there's this whole cult of, uh, of um, going to the gym and working out to have, you know, in pursuit of the perfect body. All those stories, all those ideas that you bring to the table to try and make sense of this artwork are all valid. Okay? Jump across to this artwork. Do you recognise anything about this work if we take the foreground objects out? The footbridge by Monet. Okay, the footbridge by Monet. And this artwork's by Banksy. And what has he done? What has he done to Monet's beautiful footbridge? He's appropriated. He's appropriated. Good girl, Shanae, using the language of uh, postmodernism. He's appropriated the artwork. And what, how is, what else has he done? He's recontextualised the concept. He's recontextualised the concept to be a story or a, talking about what? What's the construct here? Angelica, you've got your mouth half open. Is it going <laughs> to reveal that itself? Oh, something, something. Nothing come out. <laughs> Anyone help? Pollution. Ah, thank you, MJ. Story about pollution. Where's the next obvious thing you're going to start drawing from? What's been polluted here? The lake. The lake. And the lake is a part of the world. The world. The world has. Been yeah, and has been. <laughs> it has been polluted. Who's polluted it? We. Okay, so we're starting to get into the whole impact of humanity on the environment. The environment. Can you see where we're going? So here we are stuck in our HSC exam and these two artworks are dropped in front of us. You very quickly brainstorm, obviously, what you can see in front of you. Step back. What's the bigger story? What are the constructs that we're dealing with? And a construct at the moment, and I tend to believe this construct because there's a fair bit of scientific evidence to support it, but the construct that we're being taught at the moment is that humanity is responsible for all of the weather changes that are happening, the extreme weather ex um, uh, changes that we're experiencing. Uh, violent floods, hurricanes, uh, fires and all this kind of stuff. Man's impact on the natural environment and if we don't stop what we're doing, we're going to destroy our own habitat. That's a construct. 100 years from now, it might be, or even 50 years from now, it might actually be proved to be very incorrect. But just like people 100 years ago, they believed the constructs of their time. Can you see what I'm trying to teach you here? You'll get into your exam and you'll go, oh my god, doesn't matter. I remember that lesson from Mrs. Dongo. We did postmodernism. What's the constructs? Can I say anything appropriate? Can I see recontextualization? Is there any irony? What's the parody that I can see here? So we're going to jump past this um, definition and to have a look at the characteristics that we tend to see postmodern artists use. And we're just about out of time. 
We will come back to this on Monday. On Monday, we're going to come, don't move just yet. On Monday, we're coming back to this. What I need for you guys to do is to tell me how successful you have been in this. Oops. How successful has this lesson been in terms of you now able to list the characteristics of postmodernism? Successful. You've been successful. So I've heard two. Appropriation, parody, satire, irony. irony. What else are they doing? Okay, recontextualization. Pastiche. What have I been talking about <laughs> with the big ideas? What are they called? The constructs. Okay, in an exam, if you know what those things mean and you use that language, if you're dealing with postmodern frame, then you are going to be home and hose whether what your interpretation and your evidence says or not. Because you're able, hopefully, to be able to communicate using the language and the ideas behind postmodernism to justify whatever it is that you've written down. If anything, I hope you leave here knowing that you can interpret a postmodern artwork any way you choose. As long as you can support your claim, and you will be right. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. You may go. You're going to be away.